to introduce Jacob's mom. Thank you. Thank you. I, I am honored. I don't know that I've ever been in a room with more energy um, than this. And, and, I, and I appreciate that because um, I was telling Steve, I was, I was at a conference in Washington State the other, well, Monday, and um, the, the person introducing me introduced all of the elected officials and the mayor and everything got to me. The next speaker, I, it's just so sad. I don't even know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> this is Pat or Wedi uh, Pat, Pat and couldn't get my name right. He said, just go ahead. <laughs> it was like the worst intro. <laughs> So, you know, it was a little difficult to rise above, you know, that to, to get to um, talking about hope, which is what I was supposed to be talking about. I love your uh, purposes. Uh, it's exactly what we've been trying to do all of these years, um, promote an active interest in good government, civic affairs, inspire respect for the law, promote patriots patriotism, um, aid and encourage the development of youth. That is really what we have been fighting for. Um, Jacob, I, Jerry and I were at a, an art fest. I chaired an art festival in St. Joe. Actually, I have to go back to Steve. Steve was, Steve was very modest. He was a, a huge leader in our community. And when he was mayor, he would be the one bike, biking on the 4th of July parade route and, and making sure that he, he met everyone. And then he was our representative and he did a, an amazing job. And, and he knew Jacob and um, Mandy and Katie, his kids grew up with, um, well as Amy and Jacob were, were about the same ages. So um, it's always heartening for me back to who I was because I think that the biggest challenge is to not lose yourself along the way. And that, that is what was, was going on at first. Um, so I chaired an art festival, and at the last minute, Jerry and I decided to go. And um, we, we asked Jacob if he minded babysitting, which, you know, looking back, it sounds so young, 11. He was almost 12 uh, in sixth grade. And in sixth grade, I babysat. And, uh, you know, we were only going to be gone a couple hours. St. Joe is so small. Jerry, chiropractor. Pretty much everybody. Um, I was a stay-at-home mom, um, so it would, it would be funny. We'd go to a, a gathering, and everybody, oh, you know, would be time to leave. It's like, oh, Dr. Wetterly and uh, Mrs. <laughs> I didn't really know a lot of a lot of, of people because I, I really was all about the kids. But I chaired an art festival, and, and at the last minute, we went and um, we got to the the house and called home. Um, to tell the kids the phone number because it was a new listing. And shortly after that, Trevor called and said, we're bored. Can we ride our bikes to the store and rent a video? And, and um, I first said, um, no. It's starting to get dark, and they've never done this before. And Trevor said, well, let me talk to Dad. So it was, it was the joke. You know, it's like, your son would like to speak with you. And he said, look, I got a white sweatshirt on Aaron. Uh, Jacob's got the flashlight, or Jacob's wearing your jogging vest. I have the flashlight. Is it OK? And Jerry said, yes. And I really believe that's what we're fighting for. It should have been OK for these kids to, to bike to the store. Then they called again. And I don't know how many of you are parents, but it is the third time we talked to our kids since we left that evening. And they said, Carmen doesn't want to go with. Is it all right if Rochelle comes over to babysit? while we go to the store. They were responsible kids, and they got a, a babysitter for their little sister. Um, they went to the store, and as you know, on the way back, they were half a mile from our house when this man popped out in the middle of the road. And the next call we got was from the, next, the babysitter's father and said, you need to come home. It began the, the lar longest journey that you, you, you can imagine. And, and, Thank you for being part of it. We couldn't have done this alone. That's why I know there's way more good people in the world than bad. We've heard from so many. And people offered whatever they could. Printers 
printed flyers and people raised money for the reward fund and the search fund and they provided food and for the law enforcement. Law enforcement, I just want to give a huge shout out to law enforcement. They carried our family. They never quit on Jacob and I yes, I was a pain and I kept calling them. But they they responded and they and they never left us and, and I feel they get so little gratitude when they do something right, and yet we are so quick to judge the minute that something goes wrong. So I just want to, you know, thank some police officers when you when you leave because they do such hard work, and um, it wasn't easy. Many of them were parents too, and for them to to search all day and then go home, um, I don't know how they do what they do. Um, I am a little distracted. I think that's part of the, the process. I, um, this past year and a half has been a longer journey than I, than I would have liked um, in terms of getting my head back on straight. We had four kids at the time. Amy was 13, um, Jacob 11, Trevor was 10, and Carmen was eight. And our world was just so, you know, happy and, and comfortable. I have a video that I often show of Jacob pretending to be Jerry on Father's Day. And um, it's, it's one of my favorites because he, he's sitting there reading a paper with glasses on and he's looking all dad-like. And, <laughs> and then each, well, each of the kids comes in and tells them, you know, like, well, Dad, today I was playing baseball, Trevor says, and I accidentally broke the window and Tre Jacob says, well, it's okay, we'll, we'll get a new one. And then Carmen said, you know, today I was having a picnic with Candace and I spilled grape juice all over the rug. And Jacob said, it's okay, I'm sure you helped mom um, clean it up. And then Amy comes and says, today when I was fixing my hair, I accidentally broke your brand new hair dryer. And <laughs> Jacob, or yeah, Jacob, Jerry says, it's okay, we'll buy a new one when we get the window. <laughs> And then Trevor comes back and said, um, today I was just having so much fun, I forgot to take your basketball game. And <laughs> Jacob flips up, like, you what? <laughs> You're grounded for two weeks. You know, <laughs> anything else he could handle. But that's, that's my husband. He's, he's still into sports. And um, Jacob was one of those kids who could do a play-by-play -play of any football game, as good as the announcers, he would say something and then the, the announcers would say it too. So he was very much into sports um, and he played hockey, which I thought was really fun. I love hockey. I grew up in St. Paul. I grew up with hockey. I used to shovel the rink so my brother could play um, across the street from us. And um, But when Jacob decided to become goalie, I was devastated. How can you do that to your mom? I mean, that's really a lot of pressure. I learned to count shots on goal so I could, you know, congratulate him. Uh, you had 17 saves, you know, even if they lost, I, you know, I could give some kind of um, feedback. But I asked him if it ever bothered him when somebody scored against him. He said, no, no, not really. Um, if it went in, it was a great shot. If I stopped it, that was a great save. <laughs> you know, I heard that voice for so many years. I collected stories of kids who came back, and I could hear Jacob every time in the back of my head saying, that was a great save. I began talking to Jacob early on. I didn't, everybody said, you're so strong and brave, and I really wasn't. I was in bed pulling the covers over my head saying, I'm never, <laughs> I'm never getting out of this bed, it's too hard, it hurts too much, I can't do it. And I could see Jacob curled up in a ball somewhere saying the same thing. They're never going to find me, I can't do this, it's too hard. And I had to talk to him and it's like, hold on Jacob, we will find you, but you have to stay strong. And I thought, here I am, surrounded by all of this support, and I'm expecting him to stay strong. And at that point, that point I made a decision to get out of bed. I was recently reviewing some of the, the tape, the TV coverage at the beginning, and it wasn't me ever speaking. It was Jerry who stood in front of the cameras and he tried to, you know, ask everybody for help and, and plea on, on behalf of us. I was like staring off into La La Land. Um, 
And he did that for a long time until about 50 people turned him in as a suspect. They didn't like the way he looked on TV. Um, he wasn't sad enough, he didn't cry, he didn't do what they expected for him to do, and so he just gave it to me. It's like, they don't want to hear from me, so you're, you're up. And at that point, I, I did find the strength to, um, to get out of bed and, and to keep going. And that's a decision. You know, I, I know I've worked with searching families all of these years, and I know how hard it is to just simply get up. And some days, that was as good as it got. I got up. <laughs> you know, I, I made that decision. But at some point, I refused to let the man who took Jacob take anything else. You can't have my marriage. You can't have my other kids. You can't have the world that Jacob knew and believed in. And that was worth fighting for. And it was a, it was a battle every day. It was like I, was, I refused to let the bad guy win. And at that point, things turned. I asked law enforcement, what would, what would you need? And they told me it would have helped to have, um, uh, to know who was in the area who's done this before. So we fought to get sex offender registration. Um, they said it would have helped to have a central repository of information, which they built. The BCA now has one spot. Otherwise, every police station had all of their stuff but there was no place to, to you know, unified, unified place to, to look at who's done this before. Um, we learned about, I didn't know what I was doing ever uh, along this journey. And uh, one of my favorite quotes, it was anonymous. I have no idea where I saw it, but I've lived by it. It's like, never worry about the future. You just go as far as you can. And from there, you can see farther. And that's what we've done. You know, you, you take steps and, and, and find the next thing to do. I work closely with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Um, I got, you know, we got involved the very first couple of days. We called them and, and um, had a case manager assigned to us. And all of the case managers were retired law enforcement. So they work directly with the law enforcement agencies as they're, they're offering support to us. I know that there's some stats, um, you know, there's about 20,500 missing children every year. Most of those are runaway kids, and we know they're at tremendous, tremendous risk. About 6% are uh, parental abductions, and I've met some of those kids who got stolen by one parent and taken someplace else, and, and it's, it's horrific. I mean, they're, they're taken away from their home, their toys, their pets their school, their classmates, their best friends, and then they're plopped into another world. And, and then when they're recovered, they're stolen out of that other world where they learn to adjust and put back into a world that you know has moved on without them. It's just, just a really big, big challenge, and we know that it's um, how the harm that's caused. But I have gotten a chance to, to meet these kids and know their resilience. What we know is kidnapping has not really grown. Um, the numbers are not, you know, getting getting bigger every year. They've stayed about the same, but exploitation of children has grown exponentially. In 2016, there were about um, the National Center has this um, cyber tip line. So if you suspect you see really bad pictures and involving children online, pornography type pictures, you can call there or use their website to get there. And the first year, or in 2016, they had about 4.4 million reports, but the very next year, 2017, it was double, 8.3 million reports. Last year, there were, um, there were about um, 10 million reports to that hotline. So, you know, we have to um, look at a bigger problem. You know, it's not okay to sexually, I learned right away the um, motive behind kidnapping is for sexual exploitation, and it was so out of my realm of consciousness. Who would do that? Who would ever do that? I, I had no idea who would, who would sexually assault a child. And um, what happened is it, it was, for me, a very dark world. We were hit with suspects and people who had done this before and so often it's like 
75 or 80 percent of the time it's not a stranger who takes a child or who sexually assaults a child and so all of the entire community was almost suspect and it could be and it was hard to walk around town is it you is it you you know it was it was crazy and i found that i i couldn't live in that dark world i was dying inside and that's when i um i things turned around when i started getting letters from kids um kids are amazing one one kid wrote a this is a bart simpson drawing and it's like all right dudes listen up <laughs> on october 22nd uh, last year a fellow dude was abducted by a masked gunman you might not know him personally but his friends and family miss him man and the people all over the world are trying to find jacob wetterling it's been a year now no signs of him except calls on the hotline which aren't helping much how can you help simple keep praying for jacob to come home safe and sound and at the bottom he wrote is that too much to ask <laughs> the kids you know what i learned is that there was like this river of victimization i didn't know all these kids it was kind of like the me too campaign only this is back in 1989 and 90. last week we had a 10 year old little girl report her neighbor had molested her during my interview with the child she told me that you she had heard you speak and that she needed to tell um there was one other that was Thank you for coming to talk to us. I've experienced something similar. Well, my dad's an alcoholic and my mom left him. I was with my mom and my dad broke in and took me. Yesterday in school, we discussed your proposal that requires child molesters and kidnappers to report their addresses for 10 years after their release from prison. I feel strongly about this for two reasons. First of all, because I was a victim of sexual abuse on two occasions. Second, because I'm 13, Jacob's age. This is <laughs> Patty, thank you for coming and talking to us. It probably took a lot of courage. You're really the only person we were quiet for. <laughs> <laughs> and I love this one. You know, if you ever really get down and you don't feel so much optimism, find a kid. This is from Dalton in that lovely second grade paper, you know, with the line. Jacob of uh, Dalton. 2C, that must be his classroom. Jacob will be fine. If he isn't all right, you'll see him in heaven. My dog died. If Jacob is gone, he can play with him. And my uncle, everyone in the world wants him back. That was an image I could live with. I have seen Jacob playing with Dalton's dog on many a dark day. But it was the kids who, who turned my life around to um, to know that that's what we needed to fight for. Um, the, the way our, our case was found was resolved. I'm just going to touch on briefly. I should have brought my phone up here. Um, along the way, I, I met so many victims of, of sexual violence, and, and one of the first ones I met was Jared, who's been very active in speaking out about his victimization because he thought if he talked about it other kids might come forward and talk about it and he was very brave he also believed that it was the same guy that abducted him sexually assaulted him and then let him go but he believed it was the same guy that, that took jacob so he was doing all kinds of speaking out and in the process um, he invited my husband and i um, and joy baker the blogger who was writing about Jacob to a campfire at his house. He lives in Painesville. Actually, Jared lived in Cold Spring when he was assaulted, which is only 10 miles away. And then um, when Jacob was kidnapped, the FBI and all the officials kept interviewing Jared. So he was so stressed, his parents said enough, and they moved, ironically, to Painesville. So he now lives on Painesville on, on this farm area, and he invited all of us over for a campfire. And he invited some of the other victims in Painesville. And it was such an a, a amazing story. When, you know, you're sort of magnetized by a fire. So everybody's looking at the fire, and these kids were very open about 
about their victimization. Um, and many of them had struggled, because some of this had happened in 87. So these kids were now late 30s, 40 years old. And some of them had uh, relationship issues. They'd been divorced. They had, um, they had chemical dependency issues and um, several. One, one kid had committed suicide, and another one had attempted one of them around the fire had attempted, he was actually, he had run his motorcycle into a tree and was on disability at like 40 years old on a lot of pain meds and stuff because of the trauma of that. And um, it let me know that there were other victims and that um, without help, they struggle. But when they started coming forward, um, it, it, was, it was, you're not alone and they could support one another. We did this with the National Center. I was, I was struggling. I couldn't find anybody to talk to. Um, nobody knew what it was like. It wasn't like I could call a neighbor and say, yeah, when my son was missing, here's how we got through the holidays. Here's what we did on his birthday. Here's how we honored this. And, it was, and here's how we dealt with volunteers. The volunteers were kind of scary because we didn't know who was coming forward and, and some of them um, came from other states and, and just got obsessed with, with Jacob's case and some of them later were arrested for um, going after children. So we were, we were caught in this, this web of, of crazy stuff, but it, it let me know that we needed to provide support. Oh, so when I was working with the National Center, we set up a parent-to-parent -parent mentoring group so that we could talk to one another at least. And we put 20, pulled 24 families around the country together and did some training, and that group has now assisted over 80,000 families. It's just, it's gone on since, you know, it's 20 years old, but it's, it's an incredible resource so that it gives people support. I guess that's what was my big challenge, is I'd see something that wasn't there, and so we, we set it up, and I, um, it gave me something to fight for. So Jerry and I really didn't want a, a 25th anniversary, uh, didn't know what to do. I was out of ideas. We had done something on all the big, the big years, and I, I didn't want a 25th anniversary. Um, so we went to the sheriff and said, we don't want a 25th anniversary. We want the team back. Where's the team? At the beginning, we had the FBI, the BCA, the Tri-County Major Crime Unit, the Stearns County Sheriff's Department, and the St. Joe PD, all searching for Jacob. And it's like, I want the team back. You know, some fresh eyes, some, some new energy. Um, it's kind of like, no offense, you've had it for 25 years. Let's bring back some, some new energy and get this case solved. And um, so they called, the sheriff called a meeting, and the FBI said, well, we have a cold case review team. It's called the, the CARD team, and we can bring them. And I was excited because I do law enforcement presentations around the country, so I knew they had that, but we had never had it offered. So they came, and they reviewed. Also, the National Center did billboards. In, um, they put them up in St. Joe, Cold Spring, and Painesville. They were very strong. Uh, specific on what they were doing. John Walsh re-aired Jacob's story on the hunt. There was a lot of energy. Joy Baker was blogging and getting a lot of um, media. You know, when we think media, we think TV, radio, newspaper, but their bloggers is a whole, they touch a whole different group of people. So she was getting tips and leads there that she would forward to the, the sheriff's department. But when the FBI came, it was really interesting how they discovered um, what happened was they were going reviewing Jacob's case, but they also reviewed Jared's case. And Jared was abducted in January of 1989, and he was, you know, this car pulls up as he's walking home, and the guy asked for directions, do you know where this family lives? And when Jared turned to point, the guy pushed him into his car. And um, he took him out into the middle of nowhere, sexually assaulted him, and then left um, or drove him halfway home. And Jared ran home. And when he got home, his dad was really ticked because he was very late. He, you know, where were you? You should have been home. But his mom was so stressed. As she could tell that something terrible had happened. And she wrote, and the police recorded, the fact that when he, um, 
when he came home and he was telling what happened, he kept wiping his mouth with his sleeve. So they re-ran the sleeve and they got a DNA hit on Dan Hunter. So that's how, I mean, it was brilliant that, first of all, that she noticed that and that the police recorded that and that it's not, it wasn't the first time that clothing has been run many, many times, but DNA is better now. So they now knew that this is the guy who took him, but the statute of limitations had run out, so they couldn't charge him on anything. They couldn't search, and when they searched his house, they were looking for anything for Jacob and anything on Jared, and um, they didn't find anything except for volumes and volumes of child pornography. So they arrested him on, on child pornography, and they told us that they would offer him a small window of opportunity to talk and, and um, tell us you know, if he, if he was involved with Jacob's kidnapping, but it took a very long, it was a very slow opening <laughs> window of opportunity. They had um, suspected this man for a very long time, but the first year there were 40,000 leads. It wasn't like the only guy on their plate. There were a ton of leads. And the guy had been interviewed and even arrested at one point and locked up overnight, but he kept denying it and denying it. And it's like, how do you make people talk? Um, I had asked if they could bring in some experts who resolve cold cases around the country, but um, that didn't get to happen. So the whole case was resolved in eight days, and I'm not going to go through all of it, but it was just one Monday night when Jerry and I just came home in the evening, and somebody's pounding on the front door, and it was like, I answered the door, and it was Jared's lawyer. I'm like, that's really strange. We didn't have a lawyer. Who knew? We, we didn't ever need a lawyer. Um, but he came in and he said the U.S. Attorney's Office had called him and said the man might be willing to talk and tell us what happened to Jacob. Were we willing to, you know, sign off on a plea? And um, they knew our answer because we've been asked that before. Do you want Jacob or do you want justice? Do you want, and it's like, I'm all these years, you know, I've been searching for Jacob. I'll let the rest of the world deal with what happens to the guy. And that was also negative energy. I just couldn't. Campbell. I could only search for Jacob. So the next day we went down to Minneapolis and we met with the U.S. attorney and several staff and uh, I, what we found out is they had assigned two lawyers to just interview Danny Heinrich for all of those months that he was in jail. Not just him, but all of his friends, co-workers, anybody who might know him to try and find some stuff on him. Um, and I think that they were, the, the, they were key in getting him to to talk, plus the DNA. He was scared um, that some of the hair fibers they found in his hair samples they found in his car might come back to be Jacob's, and then he would go down for murder, and he didn't want to do that, so he talked. Um, but the thing is that that was on Tuesday, and we all had to sign off on this, including our, our county attorney had to sign off that he could never be charged in Stearns County. It was a big deal, but the following morning they, they went out to the, the FBI stayed up all night. They got clearance through Washington, which is not an easy thing to do in today's world, um, to get this guy out of jail to take him to where he said that he had, had buried Jacob. And they did that, and the first time they, they called us and, and took us out there to see, um, the next day they called and said that the bones and the teeth and the clothing, um, well, the bones and the teeth weren't human, they were animals, so we had to go through another night of, of trying to figure out what was going on, but by Friday they had identified, and Saturday the whole world got to know that Jacob had been found. Sunday was Trevor's birthday, actually, or Monday was Trevor's birthday, and we got to hear what he had, he had done, and he, he had shot Jacob the very first night. Um, it's, here's a bit of irony. Um, he took him out to this gravel pit and um, when he turned around there was a squad car flying down the road and he freaked out and he's like wait a minute you kidnap my son and drive him out into the middle of nowhere and you get scared but that's why he, he shot him so the next day was a, the hearing eight days so it was, it was absolutely stunning 
And for me, it was um, a month later than he was sentenced, and the, the plea agreement was, and, and this is, was really hard, but we're, we would never have found Jacob if we didn't agree to this. So he got 20 years um, on child pornography, nothing on kidnap or sexual assault of Jacob or Jared, but he had to admit in court what he did, so we were assured that he will not get out because it's part of his permanent record and he should probably be civilly committed. Um, and he's not a well man. He's, it's really sad. You kind of look at, were there points of in, intervention? This was a guy who had a really troubled youth, and he, he was involved in um, arson as a youth. He stole from a thrift shop. And I keep thinking, you know, could anybody have intervened and been that positive mentor, been that positive person in this guy's life early on so that he wouldn't have grown up? I don't believe he was born a child abductor, child molester, I, I don't. He was a pathetic individual and he made really, really bad choices. But it begs the issue of how are we raising kids and who's sticking up for these troubled kids because um, they all need an opportunity. And I also want to look at some of the, um, I worked for the health department. For, this was a wonderful job. For seven years, I, was, I worked in St. Paul, downtown St. Paul. I was director of sexual violence prevention for the Minnesota Department of Health. And every day, I'd go to work in the Golden Rule building. <laughs> and it was like so perfect. If we could just get that right, we might fix the bigger problem. Um, but there's a quote there um, This James Hickman wrote. In the brain, as in the economy, getting it right the first time is ultimately more effective and less costly than trying to fix it later. What are we teaching our kids? What are they learning? What are the messages our culture are giving out? Most of the kids get their um, sex education off pornography, which is very violent, it's very racist, it's very degrading, and that's not what we want them to be. Um, but that's where they get a lot of their information. Much of the video games, you get points for sexual assault. You get points for murder. You get points for all of this stuff. And it's like, where are the counter messages? And that's, I love this group. I mean, you stand for the counter messages. And we need more men to be engaged. We need men to show that it's very manly to be gentle. And that, you know, that real men care and they reach out and they're engaged and you're all doing that i love that because that is a, is a really sort of missing ingredient in our general culture right now we kind of live in a culture where nobody really trusts anyone and i used my first year teaching was um high school dropouts i taught in southern maryland on a ship <laughs> these kids were studying to become merchant marines and while they were there they could pick up their ged most of the kids got sent there through the juvenile justice system, through the courts. You either go here or you're going to get sent up somewhere. And so these kids wanted to do good. They wanted to turn their lives around. I did not know, I was never told, the crimes that they committed to get there. But it was my job, it was teacher accountability. If they didn't pass the math test, it was my fault. And so we worked really hard and we tutored and we believed in these kids and I found out that youth who have one person, often it's one person who believed in them or listened or, or cared, they could make it. It doesn't take, you know, they can come from some really bad situations, but we need to be that one person. We need to teach our kids um, how to respect one another. To me, it's like I would love it if we could have a basic civics course of teaching kids how to become good citizens. You know, how to respect one another, how to listen to one another, how to communicate with our digital world. So often kids, it, it can connect them to a world, but it also can isolate them from their, their person world. And I, and I think that that's one of the side effects that, that we have to acknowledge. Um, we need to, as adults, we need to listen. There's a billboard campaign. It's like, teach your son to respect women. We tell girls all the time what we, they need to do to stay safe. Watch your drink. Go out with friends. Um, carry mace. You know, how to not become victims. But who's teaching our boys not to become victimizers? 
You know, and that's a, it's a really a life sentence if these kids get named a sex offender. Um, there's kind of like no way out of that because it never, ever goes away. So we've worked really hard. There's a lot, you know, the National Center has some curriculum, Be Here for Kids, that can, it's age appropriate, but I think theirs start with um, ages five to eight. But I say, talk to kids when they're really little. They love their bodies. <laughs> they will, you know, flaunt, fly. they run around without any clothes on lots of time. They like their bodies, they're proud. And you can tell them, yes, you do have to put on some clothes now. <laughs> and to respect their bodies, you know, and to take care of it and to say no if somebody tries to hurt them in any way or make them feel uncomfortable. It's just like you have to care for your body. It's kind of like being a captain of, of your ship. And if somebody tries to harm it, it's, you can say no and you can tell somebody because um, it's, it's self-care. We teach them to brush their teeth and to take a bath and all kinds of self-care things. And we also need to have them know that they can stick up for their, their bodies. There's a lot of programs, Minneapolis Blueprint for, for Action, you know, and they have problems with youth. But they have four goals. Place a trusted adult in the life of every child is one of their goals. I love that. Um, intervene at the first sign of risk. I wish somebody would have done that with Danny Heinrich. Rehabilitate youth, the ones who make mistakes, let's correct it. I'm, it's about being accountable, but that's not okay in our culture. You need to do, to do this. And the fourth thing is unlearn the culture of violence. We live in a, in a culture of violence. There's a lot of ways we talk to kids. The, one of the, I get positive messages all the time on my computer. It's really what I love being <laughs> an optimist. It's, it's kind of like, uh, what is it, Zig Ziglar who said, you know, I like that motivational stuff, but it doesn't last. And his comment was, neither does bathing. That's why we recommend it daily. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's what we do. You get it daily. I, you know, this, <laughs> one of my other favorite quotes, um, this has been a year of challenge for me. Everybody um, went back to work. Um, Amy's a teacher. She went back to teaching. Jerry's a chiropractor. Trevor sells real estate, and, and Carmen helps um, people with disabilities live independently. And I, I had nowhere to go. This is my work, and I was challenged, and and I, I, I didn't know, and so I feel like I would be making progress, and then I slide backwards again. And the quote that I love. <laughs> An optimist is one who knows that when you take a step back after taking steps forward, it's not a disaster. It's more like a cha-cha. <laughs> you know, life's short, let's dance, you know. It's, uh, it works for me because that happens to me a lot. One of my favorite, uh, there's two things that I, I just want to touch on base, base, um, briefly. I got invited to uh, We Day, and it's, it's a program for high school youth. And you can't just decide to go to We Day. You have to earn your way. And these kids have to take on a project, a local project and a global project. It's changing me to we. And they have to, some of them are building schools where, and getting girls educated in parts of the world where they're not, or they're providing clean water or some of them have been working on against sex trafficking and you know that's both local and and global and then if you do so much uh, you get invited to participate and just hearing the enthusiasm and the energy of our youth who are changing the world we don't hear enough of that but energy creates more energy I love that initiative and I also um, I love the kids standing up against gun violence and I I think the whole world should be standing up against. I think that the gun manufacturers should be standing up against, against gun violence. We're talking about the violence part. You're not supposed to be shooting kids in school. You're not supposed to be shooting one another. That's not sportsmanship. That's not what. That's not legal in our country and most countries. So you know, I think we should support them in that initiative. It doesn't take away your right to have a gun. I'm not against that. But I really salute that because you know what, Danny Heinrich took a lot of kids and sexualized 
sexually assaulted a lot of kids in Painesville, but in the summer of 1989, he bought a gun. And that was the, the difference. The deal breaker was that gun, and he chose to use it. So I support them. One day, my daughter has seven-year-old twins, and she went to pick them up from school. Oh, one of them was sick, and the other one was at school. And she got to the school in St. Paul, and there was a lockdown. The police were all around the building. She couldn't get in. When um, finally they cleared it, and, and Maisie came running out. She came running up to her mom and said, Mommy, I saw the bad guy with the gun. And Carmen, who was only eight when Jacob was taken, lost it. Um, the other parents said, let's go play on the playground so they could give her a chance to breathe. And she knew that she didn't see the guy with the, guy with the gun. She, probably, she might have seen a police officer. She might have seen a gun. But, but she didn't see that. But the terror. Kids shouldn't have to grow up in that kind of terror. What is, the world, what is the world looking like that we're providing to our kids? One of the, my favorite organizations is the Search Institute, right in Minneapolis, and they talk about sparks. And think about that in your own world. What sparks you? What gets you excited about getting up in the morning? Today I get to golf, or to, today I get to go to the Optimist <laughs> meeting. What are those sparks? Because that is really what makes your life have quality and energy and that's what we need to nurture. And I think as adults, we sometimes lose those sparks. But it's really important for kids to have a spark, kids to be engaged. And many of them, they have all kinds of sparks in, in their you know, sports and music. Sometimes parents, when they talk to their kids, they don't get it right. They'll, they'll think, oh, Johnny loves football. And he asks Johnny, and he really likes to play the violin. You know, so have those conversations and engage kids to be part of your community because that kids connected to community and engaged in a positive way are much less likely to end up in the juvenile justice system. There's research on that. So we have to nurture the sparks. I, that's what I've been trying to do for the last year and a half because I can tell you when Jacob was found, it's like we lost him a second time. And, and I sort of flatlined. You know, you watch those TV movies of somebody in I never watch them because I hate ERs. <laughs> but you know, that flatline thing, that's really what I felt like. And I had to try and find what makes you get up. And for me, it was my kids and the children that I've met who made it home. I've met Elizabeth Smart. I've met J.C. Dugard. I've met um, Gina DeJesus and Michelle Knight. and, and um, Jessica Mullenberg, I've met all these kids who survived horrible situations and they've decided to turn their lives around and, and reclaim their, their world as they want it to be. And, and they're just pretty much amazing. So my kids, I'm most proud of our kids. Jerry and I, in April, celebrated 45 years, which is pretty amazing. That guy didn't take away our marriage. <laughs> And um, they, they are all amazing. Last year on Trevor's birthday, I called the night before, and he was so depressed because a year before he had found out. And it's like, how many bad days a year do we get? And he was just depressed. I sent him some corny flowers the next day. But his wife sent me a text and said, well, he hasn't gotten them yet because we've kept him rather busy. And in the morning, you know, she'd set him up for a massage. And then um, they played nine holes of golf. And then he had a luncheon with some of his coworkers and friends. And then in the afternoon, he got a pedicure. Who knew Trevor loved him? <laughs> By evening, when they were having their family dinner, he was so happy. And he taught us how to replace a really bad day with really good memories. And I think that that's a conscious effort. Um, Carmen works with people with disabilities, and, and she she had a client who was over 600 pounds, and he lived in the second floor apartment. And she arranged for him to move to a, a main floor apartment. Um, but he had a wife and, and teenage kids. But the day they were supposed to move, he couldn't get out of the, build the door. So she had, they left. His wife and his kids left, and she, he was all alone. And, and Carmen found she had to go through DHS and get a contractor to take out the the picture window in the front, find somebody with a, 
a forklift and she worked with the fire department to cover it up because he was so embarrassed and they lowered him down to the ground and, and he was met with his mother and, and an ambulance to take him to the ER and he was there for like two weeks. But he survived and it's because Carmen, you didn't give up on him. You didn't give up on him and he lives. And Amy teaches special ed and um, she was trying to find, in high school, and she was trying to find projects for these kids to do and nobody in the school had anything for them to do. So she created, um, they decided to make dog biscuits. <laughs> and they sampled different kinds with the teachers to see which ones the dogs liked. One kid is autistic, he's brilliant with numbers. That's all he can do is numbers. So he figured out how much each biscuit would cost and how much it was, how much to charge. One kid, all he could do was stamp the cookie cutter thing. One of the kids was a runner and he loved delivering these cookies to all the other teachers. And these kids are sparked. They're excited. And I thought, Amy, that's brilliant. I love that you do that. The one thing that I, I didn't touch on are the 10 things that Jacob, 11 things that Jacob stood for. And we have copies on your table with their, their pink. Um, yes. And that was amazing to watch the Minnesota Vikings, the twins. Jacob wore number 11. That was the shirt he was wearing when he was found. It was his soccer jersey number. He had a hockey number. He, had, he loved that number. Um, and so they put together, our office put together the 11 things that, that they feel that Jacob stood for. And, and I've seen them all over. One of the teachers that I met yes, last night um, has them posted in her classroom. And they, they take one a month. And, and really concentrate on what would you do to be kind? What would you do to, to be a good friend? Um, one of the schools that I was with had posters that the kids had met all around the building and they had blue posters in the back of the building, the back of the gym, and they'd made be gentle with others. They made it out of band-aids, brown band-aids, and they, and kids get it. And I thought, we live in a world where everybody knows what they're fighting against, fighting against cancer, fighting against, but what are you standing for? What are you fighting for? And I believe that those 11 things, that if we were all to do that much, the world would be a better, safer place. I am so grateful. There was a, um, a song written for Jacob by Doug Wood up in Sartell, and he wrote, there's a dream that we dream where the world, how the world should be where the children are safe, where the children are free. But we know if it's to happen, we must make it so. We are Jacob's hope, and we are Morgan's hope, and we are Ashley's. We're the hope of every child who's missing, but we're also the hope of every child who's home safe today, that they will have the right to grow up safe and follow their dreams. Thank you for being an optimist. And I love, I love this organization, all you stand for. Thanks so much.